Uh, now let me let me introduce uh, our host today, Steve Durst. He is the editor and publisher at Space Age Cup Publishing Company since 1976, and he operates its offices both in Hawaii and in California. Uh, Space Age publishes Lunar Enterprise Daily, as well as Space Calendar Weekly, and it supports pioneering ventures such as the International Lunar Observatory uh, and the Stanford on the Moon and Ad Astra Kansas initiatives. Uh, it also pursues a business plan consistent with establishing a third office on the moon. <laughs> Steve's commitment to the lunar imperative and to see people on the moon within a decade reflects his understanding of humanity's greatest advance and of the quickest way to great wealth and to the stars. Okay, last but not least, I'm very happy to say that of course Steve is a Stanford alum. He has BAs and MAs, though he, he was in the history department in 1965 and 66, so we can't take responsibility for him. Steve. <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course. This on your okay. Put that on. Yeah. How, how does it go? Yeah. Put it on. Okay. Sure it fell. I'm gonna just put it on right here. Is that okay? Yep. Is that by you? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Shami, uh, and thank you to uh, uh, Rosanna Yao and and. Uh, uh, Jennifer Tice and the entire physics department for giving us our Stanford on the Moon a home to plan for. Usually at these Stanford on the Moon alumni reunions, we're not told until days before where we're going to meet. And it's great to, uh, to see you all. And I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, Shamit, you can take some responsibility for me. I started out as a science and engineering major and, and loved taking the physics uh, 50 series at the, at the, uh, the tank that uh, some of you may remember the physics tank as, as uh, Tammy Astronaut Jernigan and I were re rem reminiscing. It was a long walk from Wilbur Hall to uh, the physics tank at 8 a.m. in the morning, but, but well worth it. So I'm, great. I'm very, very happy to be back. It does feel like a real homecoming. Um, and Stanford on the Moon began in, in the year 2000, my 35th class reunion, and I had to try and explain how I went from uh, uh, aiming for the moon and the stars uh, from a history major, looking forward rather than backward. Um, and that's how the idea got picked up, or, or during my reunion I was asked to serve on the, on the class panel, which usually deals with more traditional matters, as you know, um, second careers, taking care of elderly, but there I was talking about Stanford on the Moon with a lot of rolling eyes. Um, but it's great, the, the initiative began in Y2K in 2000, a significant year. Uh, the, we got, managed to navigate the, the uh, Stanford uh, bureaucracy and became an alumni club uh, and could use the, the name Stanford and the logo in 2006. And at my 50th class reunion a few years ago in 2015, uh, finally decided that, well, I know Stanford had so much money and I didn't give them much because of that reason up to then, but wanted to make a mark. And we started the, it turned out, uh, the bequest that I made was just enough to qualify to become an alumni, uh, uh, an endowment fund, which was great. One of the best, best things I've done, best uh, donations I've ever made. And the Stanford on the Moon Endowment Fund now, uh, you'll see. Uh, has activities, productive activities for students and uh, the departments here at Stanford. Uh, we're very, very lucky and very, very happy to have uh, one of the uh, very, very distinguished eight Stanford female uh, alumni who became astronauts with us today, uh, Dr. Tammy Jernigan. Um, and uh, she will be speaking. Um, uh, to Tammy works at uh, uh, Livermore, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, um, and we'll probably have some comments about about that. Um, so I'll let her her deal with that. But we're very happy to have Tammy speak about a theme that we've been pursuing since really since the 26 uh, uh, USA presidential campaign, when our organization, like every other organization, puts in its two bits of what they'd like to see the new, new administration do, and we tried many, many approaches to get people to the moon, and this seemed like, with a, a woman candidate, an appropriate approach uh, to advocate to the campaign, to the uh, candidates, uh, send a woman to the moon. 
and we did get responses and it seemed like a good idea regardless of, of the election and we pursued it and it's resonated uh, nationally and internationally. It's really, really very, very uh, inspiring to see the responses we got uh, from a uh, essay contest on why uh, one would wish to be the first wo woman or one of the first women on the moon. Very inspiring, very transcending, very hopeful for the future. Um, so, uh, I, and I think uh, the, the question I had, which I just discussed with Tammy, if, as, as most everybody uh, acknowledges, the landing of first men on the moon, of the first men on the moon, and I am in, in strategic collaboration with, with one of them, uh, you know, uh, Neil is no longer with us, but with Buzz Aldrin uh, today. Um, but if that was such a, a, a turning point for humanity, uh, the signature event of the 20th century, if not the last 20 centuries, when we first became a multi-world species by going to the moon, if that was so impactful and so memorable an event to humanity, which everybody acknowledges, why shouldn't the first woman on the moon be as impactful and what is its significance? I don't think it's just a, a follow-on. Oh, there were men, now finally women. I think it will be a transformative social event, social, economic, political, technical, etc. So that's, that's my perspective on that. And to uh, fill us in or to lead us forward, uh, please give a, a, a very uh, strong Stanford welcome to uh, Stanford alum, uh, astronaut, Tammy Jernigan. Thank you. So before I talk about going to the moon, I wanted to share some of my experiences with you on the space shuttle. And I in particular wanted to share one of the most character building experiences of my professional career. And I mention this because I think doing these great adventures like going to the moon, going to the Mars, requires a lot of perseverance. And I think there are bumps along the way, inevitably. You know, space exploration is a tough business, right? This, I know many of you may know, a couple of weeks ago, Soyuz just aborted a launch, right? They had a, a failure at booster separation. The crew took a pretty exciting ride. Um, they're fine. But things happen. And so Soyuz won't be back online until they figure out how to hopefully ensure that doesn't occur again, but it's a tough business. So there will be bumps along the way and that we have to have the intestinal fortitude, the political will, if we're gonna go beyond the space station orbit. So with that, let's see. So to start the slides, right? How do I? Let's see. Oh, does it? Okay. Okay, so I'll just start by saying that. So I flew five times on the shuttle. So between 91 and 91, 91 and 99, thankfully, knock on wood, the shuttle brought me home five times safely. The space shuttle was stood down in 2011. Um, so it has been a number of years since the United States has had the capability to put astronauts on the space station and we have been dependent on our Russian partners. So thankfully we had Russian partners to depend on, but it's a single fault, fit, a single fault, we're single fault tolerant, so to speak. Okay. So all that's good. So the space shuttle, so I'll just brief the slide you see in part on the right. So the space shuttle, um, it consists of the shuttle itself, so that's the part that went into orbit around the Earth, two solid rocket boosters, and an external tank that carried liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen that fueled the main engines on the space shuttle. Ah, thank you. So, this? Yeah, the side. Perfect. Back and forth. Okay. And the top button's a laser. Okay, thank you. So, again, two solid rocket boosters, three main engines, about eight million pounds of thrust, to hurl a four and a half million pound vehicle into orbit. Most of um, the fuel burns off pretty quickly, so the vehicle accelerates to about 18,000 miles an hour. So back in 90, the beginning of 96, five of us were assigned to what many of us believe to be the premier flight on the manifest. Back in that time, there weren't many spacewalks. Now, spacewalking is routine on the International Space Station. 
but back then that was not the case. So I have a five person crew, we had two spacewalks planned, two deployments of satellites within the cargo bay of the shuttle, two re-rendezvous and retrievals with those robot arms. It was an extremely exciting, extremely demanding flight. And because we were weight limited and space limited, we were a five person crew. So there was plenty of good stuff to do for everyone on board. But fate did not smile upon us. The training was particularly hard because we had to do a lot of thermal vac training. And that's where you take the space hardware and you put it in a thermal vac chamber. So you know you're minus a few hundred degrees, you're at 10 to the minus six tor. Um, that suit that I'm wearing right there weighs, weighs several hundred pounds. There's a steel cable attached to it to offload the weight. Um, and so we were testing this equipment and there were a lot of engineers who didn't see their families very much because the mission was fast tracked for 10 months. So we get on orbit, all the equipment checks out perfectly. The spacesuit checks out perfectly. The hatch won't open. So we're inside the airlock and we can't get the hatch open. So Tom and I, Tom Jones, he's a planetary scientist and also an Air Force pilot. You might imagine that Tom and I tried a few times before we said those infamous words, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> so it turns out we tried for quite a while. When we called down, Mission Control scratched their heads and said, so one of my friends was the capsule communicator on this flight. So the Capcom says, you know, Tammy, I hate to ask you all this question, but are you turning the handle the right way? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look in the airlock of the shuttle, there's this gigantic arrow <laughs> that makes it quite clear which way you were to turn this handle. So we assured him we were turning the handle the right way. So everybody scratched their heads, but you have to have a sense of humor to be in the astronaut program because the next morning, this is the cartoon that got sent up. <laughs> <laughs> and then knowing I was a physicist made that just a little more fun for them to say. Okay, but fortunately, or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, but for us, we were really relieved to understand that there was nothing that we could have done or should have done differently on orbit, that this, this was kind of set up. Um, see this little screw right here? Turns out on launch, that screw came out, vibrated, got caught in the gearing system, so when we went to rotate the gears, it jammed in the gears. Um, it was supposed to have a locking insert and there had been an inadvertent vendor substitution putting non-locking inserts on those screws. So we, it was just a un, an unlucky day. But fortunately, we hung in there. And so on my next flight, I also got signed to spacewalk. So I want to introduce the crew. So Dr. Dan Barry, a medical doctor. Uh, Kent Rominger, Navy fighter pilot. Julie Payette. Canadian computer scientist. Dr. Ellen Ochoa, also from Stanford, electrical engineer. Valery Tokarev, Russian fighter pilot. Rick Husband, Air Force fighter pilot, who we lost in 2003 on the Columbia. Um, but what's interesting to me is that, you know, Rick and Rommel used to spend all their time trying to figure out how to shoot people like um, uh, our Russian friend down, right? And so now here we are collaborating, right? And even when the politics gets tough, the international collaboration in space has still held for space station. And I think there's something to be said for that, that has been a much healthier environment in which to communicate. And there are ripples, but it is nice to have an avenue to work across country lines even when things get rough. And of course, you've heard about me. And our mission was to do a ground up rendezvous to the space station. This space station is about 80 feet long, just to give you an idea. Now it's about the size of a football field. But at the time we went in um, 1999, it was about 80 feet with just these two solar panels. So there's a picture of the shuttle on the pad. Oops. We launched out of Florida because we want to take advantage of that thousand mile an hour rotation of the Earth. 
we launch toward the east and we need to launch over water because we're going to dump the, drop the solid rocket boosters in the water and the Navy's going to pick them up and we're going to refurbish them and use them again. You can see the three main engines burning. They'll, the fuel from this tank to these engines, those engines will burn for about eight and a half minutes. The solid rocket boosters will only burn for about two minutes and then their fuel will be expended and they will, they will fall away. And just for fun, there's a picture of the San Francisco Bay Area, the Bay Bridge. But that was taken with a good lens. That's not, <laughs> that's not a visual out the window. <laughs> and there's our target, the space station. So a couple days after launch, we do a series of on-orbit burns to match our orbits. And then we do a very slow controlled docking to the station. And fortunately, the hatch opened quite easily. So here I am out on this robot arm. Ellen is flying the robot arm from inside. And I spent about five hours on the end of this arm. And we're transferring, here's a piece of Russian hardware that we're transferring to the outside of the station. And I'll show a little video of that. And then here on the end of the arm again, so here's the robot arm. My foot are constrained in a tool stanchion because you have to be constrained and tethered, right? Because everything floats. You don't want to float away. And this is a piece of um, hardware. And all this hardware weighs several hundred pounds, but of course in orbit it's quite easy to manage. So let me just show a little bit of the movie to give you an idea of what these space adventures are like. So here's our patch. It's probably one of the biggest challenges is to get the crew to agree on a patch design, especially an international crew who thinks their color should be overrepresented. <laughs> okay, shuttle on the launch pad. We walk out about five hours before the opening of the launch window. Main engines light first. About six and a half seconds later, the solid rocket boosters light. And it is a real kick in the pants. So eight million thousand, thousand excuse me, eight million pounds of thrust are going to accelerate the vehicle to about 18,000 miles an hour. So it's a pretty exciting ride. So after two minutes, the solids came off. Of course, it was the solids that, a failure in the solids that caused the first shuttle accident. But here they work perfectly, main engine still running. We'll drop the tank after we're in orbit, it'll burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. We'll open the payload bay doors, and the view out the back once those payload bay doors are open is extraordinary. It's just a beautiful earth. And so again, our crew, there's Kent Rominger. Oops, my apologies. Sorry if I have to start this over. I'm sorry, can you help me, Steve? There we go. I'm sorry, I don't know how to speed it up for you. So you have to listen to the spiel again. <laughs> so when the cargo bay doors open, could you see through? Like, could you? So you have, you're looking out the aft windows in the cockpit. So the payload bay doors, so then you're just looking in the payload bay door. It's when the doors open, then you can really see out the back. You can see out the front. Um, but the view isn't as wide, wide field. And this is really interesting because when those main engines light, you get what's called a twang. So you're in the vertical, so you're about 150 feet up, and the vehicle does this. And I always used to have this thought, oh my gosh, I hope those solids light when you're purely vertical and we don't hit the tower. You know, it's funny what you think about. <laughs> and then the first, the first time I flew, um, the commander, the pilot made a comment asking if we were on fire because it was so, <laughs> there was so much glow. So that was, for the rookies, that was an exciting question. <laughs> and the sound. Okay, so here we are. Solids are going to come off. I'm going to set this down. So 
So it's only eight and a half minutes until you're in an elliptical orbit. And then at about the 45 minute point, you do a burn to circularize your orbit. Okay, here are the payload bay doors opening, the view of the Earth. But the timeline is typically extremely busy. So Kit Rominger, you can see all the checklists, the displays, the old-fashioned displays. There's Rick Husband going through the checklist. So we want to make sure that we do execute all these burns properly so we match the orbit with that of the station because we're doing the ground-up rendezvous. Here I am catching a snack on the fly. <laughs> Ellen, Dr. Ellen Ochoa, electrical engineer again from Stanford. Dan Berry, the fellow spacewalker. Julie computer scientists and did some of our photo documentation for us. Also helped us get suited up in the airlock. Valery Tokarev, our Russian. And again, the view of the Earth. So we'll do preps to get ready for the spacewalk. We'll check out cameras. We wear a cooling garment under our spacesuits that has little tubes running through it. So we run water through to stay cool. Ellen is, um, was lead on the robot arm, so she's checking out the arm. And it has, a, you can see, a camera on the end of the arm. And so it's ra now the arm's wrapped around looking down on the top of the orbiter. And this is a not to scale animation of how we would come up toward the top, call it the positive V bar and in a very controlled manner bring the docking ring that's on the space shuttle to mate up with the docking ring on the space station. And the trick is you have to hit hard enough to actuate the mechanism but not so hard that you violate its structural integrity. So it's about 0.8 to 1.2 feet per second is the range you're looking for. And Rommel and Rick did a great job with the rendezvous. And we have lots of checklists. He has his hand on a hand controller. That's a cage around the controller so you don't hit it inadvertently. But every time he moves that, it fires a thruster. Vernier thrusters or small thrusters when you're in that close. And you can see the shuttle and station coming together. And we have also an old-fashioned docking target. We have lots of fancy displays, but we have an old-fashioned docking target to use. So we're congratulating Kent on a great job he did. And now I'm going to, so we have what's called a soft dock. So their hooks are on. And now what I'm going to do is create what's called the hard dock by actuating some mechanisms through these switches in the cockpit. The station here and the shuttle here. Okay, so here, this is the liquid cooling garment I mentioned. It has little tubes running through it to keep your body at the right temperature. You have a dial you can use, hot or cold. It's a pretty crude system, but it works well enough. There's Dan checking out his visor. So because you orbit the Earth every 90 minutes, approximately, you have sunrise, sunset. So yeah, this visor is really important. And we also have helmet lights for the night passes. So fortunately, the hatch opened quite easily. So I came out and then Dan came out. And again, astronauts get a lot of um, visibility, but the truth is there are thousands of people who make this mission possible. We are in constant contract with mission control. There are people who built the vehicles, designed the experiments, our admin folks. It is an extraordinary team effort. So Dan and I are getting ready um, to do some transfer ops. So this is me and the foot restraints on the end of the robot arm, Ellen inside, and we're, Ellen and I are in constant communication about those operations. And we're going to take equipment outside of the cargo bay. And we're going to put it on the outside of the station as, to support the build of the station to more modules. And this is, so I'm on the arm. And then Dan scaled the vehicle and then made sure that we, when we did the attachment, the attachment was secure. Here we are pulling a piece of Russian hardware out of the cargo bay. We had a little trouble with the braking torque. The braking torque was exceeded the capability of the tool. So we basically got a big cheater bar, you know, like you would if you're taking a lug nut off a car. 
and just cranked on it and broke the, broke the torque on that bolt. Because you don't want to take it all the way to space and not be able to take it out of the cargo bay and have to bring it back home. So we undid one end. Ellen is flying in an arc so that we can rotate up this piece of hardware. And then Dan unattached attached it, excuse me, detached it. And then we carried it over to the space station. Okay, so just to give you a feel of what spacewalking looks like. Okay, now on to beyond. Okay, so the space station you saw that we were docking with was about 80 feet long. So now it's about 356 feet. It looks very similar to this. The configuration changes as modules and soil uses and progresses get moved around. And now we actually have commercial vehicles. So SpaceX is delivering cargo to the space station. And we have an international crew on the space station that is three instead of the five that was anticipated. Because, so, oops, I apologize. You'd think I could do this one. All right, so ESA astronaut, Russian, US. She's a former flight surgeon. But they are now a three-person crew, so there are some logistics issues now, right? You have a workload associated with the five-person crew, but now you only have three folks on board. You have a Soyuz that had a failure on October 11th um, at um, initial booster separation, and now you have to figure out, when can I fly a Soyuz again? When's it going to be safe to fly again? How do I get all the logistics on orbit? Um, what am I not going to do, right? And it's very expensive not to do something. All right, is there some? It's not projecting again. Can you take a look for me? Thank you. Okay, so there's just a lot to work out. Now, international partners and the commercial space industry is going to play a more and more compelling role in space exploration. So SpaceX is already taking cargo to the space station. And there is a plan for test flights um, for vehicles from both SpaceX and Boeing, Boeing's vehicles called Starliner. Um, so there's a test flight, hopefully in 2019, and what's called an operational flight in 2020. And the crews for those flights, some of you may have heard in the news, have been assigned. And there is a woman on each of the two Starliner flights since we're talking about women in space and on the So I think that, it's okay. Can I have some more? <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you want this? Okay, so I say this is fine. So I think that there is um, tremendous opportunity for exploration, but it takes a lot of cooperation and a lot of political will. And I think the technical challenges not that they're not compelling, maybe one of the most of which is how do you shield the astronauts from radiation? And you may have to decide you draw your wrist line in a different place. Um, but I think those challenges are within our grasp. I think the challenge is political, is maintaining political will over multiple administrations for a program that's quite expensive and requires a lot of compromise internationally if you're going to go with an international community. I think that is the real challenge. You know, they used to say you can't go to the moon in 20 years. You can go in 10, but you can't go in 20 because you can never keep that focus for that length of time. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. So do I think, I, so I tell kids, I think there's a kid in school today who will go back to the moon and Mars. You know, I don't know when that will be. I hope it's soon. And I hope this renewed effort, you know, we, I'm on the NASA Science Council and um, the NASA administrator talked about the commitment um, to go back to the moon and have a permanent presence, whether that's around the moon or on the moon, and that it will be an international and commercial effort. And I think those words are great. I just hope we're able to sustain them, you know, through each of the subsequent elections and administrations. Because when you really find out what folks really want to do, you see how they vote with their pocketbook. So you have to have sustained funding to do this. Okay. 
I appreciate you working my audio visual problem. Okay, and those on the right, those the pictures you see on the right, those are um, the vehicles. So there's the Dragon capsule, the pointy looking capsule that says SpaceX, and then the Boeing Starliner. And then there's a whole different enterprise that has to do with space tourism. And I think that's a different fish. But, but there are some companies that want to do both, right? They want to do partnership with NASA for what I might call more space exploration and discovery. And, but then they also want to have um, efforts um, because people are curious, right? There are people who have a lot of money that they're willing to pay to go to space for that adventure. But I, I think that's just a separate kind of enterprise. Okay. So. Back to where you were. Okay. Okay, so there's our crew on orbit. Excuse me. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay. Should I hit the right button here? And here are the um, crew members that have been signed to um, fly on Starliner and SpaceX. And again, that group of folks, there's Sunita Williams. So Sunita and I were contemporaries. Mm -hmm. And um, she's, I think, a military pilot. But I have, I have not met her. Man, I think her last name is Mon or Man. Um, but anyway, these are the folks who will fly on the first commercial crewed vehicles. And just to give you an idea of scale, so here we, here's the shuttle. And this is a configuration that might take you to cislunar orbit with, again, the crew capsule on top. And a lot of these plans are very notional. So there's a lot of work still being done on exactly what orbits they're going to go into, exactly what the time scale is, because there have been some challenges with some of the testing that's been done in the commercial side. There's been some engine issues, but in the space business, that's normal. And just an artist concept. And again, I think the next destination, you know, I think it's up to the young people today where we go next and, and trying to maintain that political will. So with that, I'm happy to stop and answer any questions. Yes? Beyond the, the sort of general inspiration of having human presence on the moon, when you're trying to argue to the politicians that they should support this for a period of 10 or 20 years, what are the best arguments that human presence on the moon it would, would be scientifically useful, industrially useful? Uh, what, are, what are the arguments that we use? I actually think it's harder to convince the scientists because, <laughs> right, because the politicians, many politicians are about leadership, right? U.S. leadership in space, not wanting to be left behind. Some are more about international cooperation. What a wonderful forum on which to operate, right, as opposed to military conflict. I don't think anyone would argue against that idea. I think it's the scientists who say um, science per unit dollar. Because I don't think that, it, so I'm a physicist, my background is in astrophysics. I think if you look at pure science per unit dollar, it would be hard to argue that human exploration is more cost efficient. I think that's just not true. But you have to feel like there is something fun, fundamentally different from putting, let's say, a human on the top of Mount Everest and a robot, right? If you think there's a difference in that, then I think you understand why human exploration is different than robotic ex exploration. But I think the argument's multifaceted, right? I think it's about international cooperation. I think it is about American leadership, but leadership with cooperation. I think it's about scientific discovery because you're there and you're going to do, you know, people like astronomers are excited about doing astronomy from the moon. It might not have been the mission they would have chose had they been given a blank piece of paper, but boy, they're going to take advantage of it if the platform exists. And there are a lot of experiments that can be done. And there is an effort to try to get more commercial interest and commercial customers, but the cost has to be rational. So I think it is a multifaceted argument. Yes. I've never had a chance to talk to an astronaut before. I'd like to ask you kind of a human interest question. How does it work? Uh, when do, do they tell you when you have to go or how many flights you get? How did, how did your career go? Okay, so I was getting, I was an undergrad at Stanford. I got a bachelor's and master's in Stanford. I got, I was, uh, got interested in astrophysics. I transferred to Berkeley. I was getting my PhD at Berkeley. I got selected, was being fast-tracked for a two-year mission. Um, and Challenger blew up six months later. So then there was a six-year hiatus in the program. 
or several, three, a three-year hiatus in the program. So it was six years before our class flew. So mostly you fly so, your first flight somewhat in order. Not precisely, but somewhat in order. Okay, and then you, they also look at what are the needs of the mission. So for example, there was a mission, I've flown on one flight that was very focused on astrophysics. It was called Astro 2, and we took up a, a suite of ultraviolet telescopes um, to do ultraviolet observations. Stars, galaxies, planets, early universe, very exciting flight. And I was assigned as the payload commander because of my background in astrophysics. And the Astro 1 mission had failed. And so I got assigned early to make sure, basically to help ensure that we did not experience another failure. Okay, so you get assigned somewhat in order, but if you have background that's relevant for the needs of a particular mission, it changes the order. And then, um, so for example, my athletic background I think was very helpful for me because training in those spacesuits, that training is pretty arduous. You know, if you're a petite person, that that's tough. Having an athletic background for me, especially as a woman, was, was foundational. And so that's why I was assigned to do those flights where that had spacewalks. Um, Ellen is an outstanding arm operator. Outstanding, right? So when they have a flight that has arm operations that require real precision and skill, someone like Ellen is going to get assigned that. Thank you. Yes? When you reached orbit for the first time and looked back at Earth, do you, do you remember what you thought? Did you have any existential moments or profound revelations? So I think that, I remember when I was at Stanford, this may sound like a non sequitur, but it will make sense for you. When I was at Stanford in grad school, I had a roommate, and she spent a lot of time um, protesting, okay? I was in grad school in physics. I did not have time to protest, right? So I used to marvel at her dedication. So I wasn't, it's not that I didn't care about the environment, it's just I, I, had, another, I had another focus, right? I had an academic focus. When I got in orbit, and my first flight was in 99, and that is when Saddam Hussein lit the Kuwaiti oil fields ablaze. And from orbit, you could see this really noxious smoke being pumped into the atmosphere. And I remember being so offended, I mean, just to my core, right? That what right did he have to do that to the entire planet? Because as trite as it sounds, when you look, it is this thin, it is this beautiful blue orb and this thin, fragile atmosphere. And I, that's the thing that struck me the most on my first flight was seeing those oil fires and seeing that obnoxious smoke being pumped into the atmosphere. Yes? About 10 days or two weeks ago, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report came out that suggested that we have 10 or 12 years remaining to take our carbon pollution to zero if we are to avoid, avoid really we don't have words for the tragedy. How do you regard and, and other astronauts the, the kind of role that you may have to play in bringing awareness and fostering appropriate action? I mean, I think most of the astronauts I know are environmentalists just from looking at this Earth in this sort of fragile state. Um, I think, though, that there are just some political trade-offs that we're going to have to work really hard to make. I, I um, you know, scientific data isn't as clean as you want the story to be, and that gets exploited, right? It gets exploited because scientists, we don't tend to talk about absolutes, right? This is absolutely certain. We say, well, within this era and these uncertainties, when I think when you talk politics, you can't say that. You have to say, you know, we're going to hell in a handbasket, and we need to do something now. <laughs> My question is about the sort of communication, the mediation role that astronauts might be able to play in bringing awareness and urgency to a general public. I, I, I certainly think that we we get some attention, right? So I'm not a current astronaut, right? So that 
you know, I'm a former astronaut. You have a nice history behind you. No, true. I mean, and certainly, and, and certainly we advocate, but, but it's going to take political will. I mean, true political will, I think, to change things. Because it's about the economy, and it's about jobs, and it's about understanding how compelling the problem with is and a, a problem that not everybody wants to hear. So, but that doesn't mean we don't keep fighting the good fight, absolutely. Yes? Um, if the Suez cannot be made ready in time for a December, January launch, can the Suez, the crew that's up on the ISS, extend their stay up yes. on the ISS? They can. And there's a Soyuz vehicle on orbit. The other thing that complexity is that the Soyuz vehicle on orbit has a lifetime. But that lifetime, I think they've got 200 and something days left on it. So you have that issue too, because that's your lifeboat. But it's, it's not an easy thing when, when you lose confidence in your only vehicle that can take astronauts. It's not just that it didn't launch these two folks. It's the fact that now you've got to figure out when do you have confidence to attempt the next launch. And the logistics problems, because we have SpaceX and because there are progress vehicles, you can get up the logistics. But that crew's going to be working really hard, that three-person crew. And there will be things that don't get done. Yes? Yeah. When you heard this week um, the Space Council's recommendation for Space Force, and you know internally the, the number of political uh, webs that will have to be um, coordinated. What do you think is the likelihood of that vision? And assume that it did come about, how would that knit together an international uh, conscious, uh, consciousness around it? So, so I don't think that I'm qualified to answer that question. But when I ask my military friends that at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, They'll say things like, you know, in principle, Space Force isn't a bad idea, and it's been around for a while. But in practice, it's extremely difficult to implement. So when I ask them, I hear skepticism about the challenges of implementation. But I don't feel that I'm personally qualified to really answer that. Yes? What do you think will be the biggest challenges facing the next generation of astronauts? I, again, I think maintaining continuity. You know, during the Reagan administration, so when I, I had been in the program six months when we lost Challenger, and Ronald Reagan came to the Johnson Space Center, and he made it clear that, you know, we're going to replace that orbiter, we're going to find out what happened, and we are going to continue. That kind of support, um, I don't think that we have seen, at least in my lifetime, you know, other than, you know, Kennedy. And I, I really think it's about political will, and, and I also think it's about Figuring out the rightful role of that government commercial partnership. That adorable young lady in the back. Uh, I think seeing our beautiful earth, that beautiful blue earth, and being able to float. Like if you were in school and you could float into your classroom, wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> Those are my favorite things. Good. <laughs> yes. Um, from a technical perspective, um, how long do you think it will be? How many estimate dec how many decades, how many years, till space uh, our science will be to the level that we could, space will be militarized? I'm not saying it's a good thing, but I know that it, from a military, you know, if you look at an air force perspective of different countries think about that. And right now it's nice not to have that capability other than doing intelligence surveillance, right? It's it's really nice to be able to cooperate and use space for peaceful positive purposes. But uh, progress <laughs> science marches on it. Well I think there's a firewall. I think there's a firewall between the unclassified civilian space and what goes on in the military. And, and I don't think that the two can cross for security reasons. Okay. So that question is difficult to answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Are astronauts going to be able to be astronauts? Are people who are traveling up there 
or living up there for a while, concerned about detritus that's from other disintegrated or other. Uh, you mean orbital debris? You mean yeah. you mean a, in a crossing orbit? Yeah. Absolutely. So the Air Force can track the big stuff, but if you know if you get a screw in a crossing orbit, right at 18,000 miles an hour, you're going to be hit pretty hard. So sure, it's an issue, and it's more and more an issue. Remember the Chinese ASAT test, right? It's where they put thousands of pieces of debris into Earth orbit, right? So yeah, those are concerns. And the more satellites we put up, the greater the concern. Because the stuff that you can track, you can do an orbital burn and you know, move your footprint, depending on how much risk you want to take. Made the rounds up there, or the. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Let's see. What can I say? <laughs> I was spacewalking in an alien bunker. Yes. <laughs> Two spacewalkers floated into a bar. <laughs> I just made that up. I mean, there's the astronauts' prayer. You know, everybody says, "Are you afraid? Right? Are you afraid of dying?" Or the answer is absolutely not. You're afraid of messing up. So the prayer is, do we still have a camera? <laughs> you know, please God, don't let me screw up. Really, that, that is your biggest fear. But we have a good time. I mean, I, the crews I've flown on, we work really hard, but we're a tight-knit group, and we have each other's back. And that is one of the most wonderful things about having been in the program, is that camaraderie. And I think that was true when I was in the physics department, you know? We're in those tables late at night cranking out those physics problems that these evil professors. <laughs> you know, I was saying earlier, like, I kept those dang problem sets for decades because I, they had spent so much of my life as an under. I took all the graduate physics courses also, and um, that was a lot of time. I just couldn't part with them. Yes? Just following up on Shaman's question and this sort of how do you weight science per dollar versus right. the inspirational power? Like, you know, it's very clear that it's hard to quantify how powerful it was, you know, when the first man was on the moon. What, what is your vision of what that would look like in the future? Would it have the same power? Would it be different? I think Mars will be the most compelling story. So I'm sorry, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> First things first. But, but, but um, there is a belief that the moon is the way to get to Mars. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, but I think it will be compelling. But, but to your question about inspiration, so I was a grad student studying astrophysics, which I thought was really interesting. <laughs> and I used to give talks to kids, motivational talks, or I taught undergraduate classes, and people were really excited, right? And that was a good experience. When I got accepted as an astronaut, like same person a week later, the level of excitement was an, increased by an order of magnitude. Not because I was any different, it was there was just something about putting human beings out there that was exciting. So I think it's different. I'm not arguing it should or shouldn't be, but my experience is that it is. And I think the programs are complementary. So I started, when I was an undergrad at Stanford, I worked at Ames Research Center, and I used to test the heat chill material for the Galileo probe. So we used to vaporize a sample. We used a neodymium laser to vaporize a carbon phenolic sample, analyze the vapor products to decide how thick that heat shield should be for the probe, the Galileo probe. Okay, so I thought the man's, the, I guess crude now is our new word, but I thought that the exploration program um, was fascinating. And I think those programs are complementary. You could never do human spaceflight without the robotic program, right? You would never do that. Those programs are complementary, and I think they ought to be supportive of each other. Yes? Um, you have to tell me when you want me to. <laughs> Go ahead. The past few years of ice, of frost on the moon, do you think that uh, increases the moon's potential for exploitation uh, as opposed to when they thought there was no water on the moon? I think it makes it more exciting because the issue of life is very exciting to people. You know, this idea of, you know, an, an orbital body that could sustain life, even if that's not true right now, I think it's just 
increases the level of excitement and then you know you have to think about what that means as a resource if anything to take one more question for Tammy and and then I think there'll be an opportunity after this conference in 20 minutes or so we have a special special opening and surprise uh, in the physics lobby for you all uh, the first uh, lunar exhibit at Stanford the first Stanford on the moon lunar exhibit that uh, Tammy I hope when we finish our discussion here, we'll, we'll do the honors of officially opening. Um, do we have one more question, or should we hold it for later? Any compelling question? Uh, well, okay. Yes. Okay. How, how many uh, plane rides did it take, or vomit comet rides did it take to get used to weightlessness? <laughs> okay, so oh, the vomit comet. So the KC-135, I think, is the official name. <laughs> so. Um, some people think that NASA has a zero gravity room. And I know some people think that because I had a neighbor who lost a bet with her husband in this regard. <laughs> so we, we did not have a zero gravity room at NASA, but what we did have is an aircraft that would fly parabolic trajectories. And as you came over the top, you got about 30 seconds of weightlessness. And you would do this uh, 40 to 60 times in a row. And some people found that physically uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> But it was nice to get a sense of what weightlessness was like. Okay, you guys are an awesome audience. Thank you very much. Over to you. You're welcome. Well, th thanks so much, Tammy. Um, and and it awesome. I, I should have mentioned what, what uh, earlier in introducing Tammy, five flights in the 1990s. Um, <clears throat> A rarity, less than, less than six, only 500 and something human beings, 60 years after Yuri Gagarin, have had that experience of uh, traveling in space, uh, 18,000 miles an hour. Uh, I recently had a lot of traveling this past month, I think almost 50,000 miles, and realized if I had had the right boarding pass, it could have been done in three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think also that, that uh, Stanford is unique uh, in, in developing and supporting uh, astronauts, especially female astronauts. I think, I think other than Purdue University, Stanford has, has uh, generated more astronauts than any other university outside of the uh, service academies. Um, and along, we all know about Sally and uh, one of Tammy's uh, space Traveling mates, Ellen Ochoa, uh, the first Hispanic woman in space, Correct. recently the director of the Johnson Space Center. Uh, Mae Jemison, the first uh, black woman in space and now involved in, in the 100-year Starship pro program. Uh, Susan Helms, I believe the first uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Air, uh, Air Force Space Command general. Uh, Barbara Morgan, the alternate follow-up to Krista McAuliffe. Um, who else am I leaving off now? Um, but a, a, a remarkably uh, distinguished group of women. Uh, Eileen Collins, the first space shuttle uh, pilot and commander. And uh, Kathleen Rubens, the uh, youngest, uh, youngest female astronaut from, to graduate from Stanford, that my associate at the back of the room who's worked so hard with, uh, to put this event on, Aviva Boyd, interviewed Kathleen Rubens uh, for the KCSU radio station uh, a while ago. Um, so I think it's a, a remarkable accomplishment, and thank you for sharing. I did, hadn't realized that you did all that, that, you did your graduate work in astrophysics, and I'd love to, love to talk uh, uh, stars with you and uh, our, our Lunar Observatory project in Hawaii has a first, has its mission of first light. What do you look at when you put it when you can open your eyes at the moon with a telescope? A lot of time, you know, we asked a hundred ask, uh, astronomers and got hundred and one answers, and chose the the, uh, the largest and perhaps most inspiring object to look at the Milky Way, the center of the Milky Way, which I believe when we go back and in the 42 years. Only one spacecraft has landed on the moon in 42 years. Uh, there are about to be three that are landing in the next few months, so uh, moon landings are just coming up. And I've never met 
any, any person wanting to go back to the moon that didn't want to go to Mars and, and Europa around Jupiter and Titan around uh, Saturn. Never met one. Uh, you know, we, we in, the, in the lunar advocacy community say uh, moon in five years and Mars in ten. Um, and it's, you know, the moon is 500 times closer than Mars. So I think that when a human sets foot in another world again, uh, it almost certainly will be the moon. Uh, not saying that we don't want to go to Mars. And, uh, the moon also is referred to as the eighth continent. It's the Earth's eighth continent for, for a variety of reasons, economic and technical and, and others. Um, so, uh, again, I've never met a, a, a lunar advocate that didn't want to get to Mars ASAP as well. Um, I wanted to also mention we have some, and, and thank the physics department once again, I'll do that still again, is, is the, the former uh, physics chair still with us, Peter, Peter Michelson, who's been very, very supportive of our event. I saw him duck in a while ago. Um, so, so it's a, a real treat for me, and I, I can see for everybody here uh, to have, have shared uh, through Tammy's uh, discussions what, what uh, space flight uh, was and some of the problems. I think her pointing to uh, the political uh, will and realities is, is perhaps indeed uh, as, as great a uh, uh, factor to overcome as, as anything else. And the economic benefits in terms of uh, materials and energy from the moon also. The technological up. advancements. And then the technological advances giving us the capability to do solar system exploration and travel. So we want to look out at the galaxy when we go back, out at the Milky Way, out at our future. And I think that first image, there's never been an image of the Milky Way ever taken from the moon. And when we go back to the moon and stand there, we'll look not back at Earth as we did in the 20th century, but out towards the future. And I think that first image of the, the Milky Way, of the galactic center, uh, will be as inspiring, directional, uh, as that first image of Earthrise uh, over the lunar surface. Um, before we get to our, our grand finale, which is a, a, a real treat, the first lunar exhibit that, that the uh, physics department has, has very generously uh, offered to, to host in the lobby that we'll adjourn to in about uh, 15 minutes because the uh, physics department wants to set up for another event. Um, we should tend to a few Stanford on the Moon Alumni Club matters. Uh, we have a, an advisory uh, committee that you should really to any of you here. If you're interested in uh, serving on the Stanford on the Moon Alumni Club advisory committee, please send an email uh, if you have ideas about how to encourage research here at the university uh, in any of the departments, not just physics. Um, but, and, and to support student or department initiatives, please let us know. 